How do you do? Once there was a little girl, seven years old, who lay in a hospital bed for a month, wondering if she would live or die. As she looked out the window at the clouds, she knew that if there really was a God, he would decide if she would live or die. And she was right. Why then did she grow up and live recklessly without regard for the one who let her live? Understanding came only when her heart and mind and life were unshackled. Dramatizing true life stories that light the darkness, this is Unshackled, produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. He's our neighbor living down the street on the edge of despair, always hungry, never rested, wary of being hurt. We see the homeless and look away because we don't know how to help. But folks at Pacific Garden Mission know what to do, and they've been faithful to help since 1877, providing refuge to street people, hot meals, clean clothing, and a bunk for the night. And the mission also provides dental and medical care if needed, and all without charge. Pastors and counselors at the old lighthouse offer the one sure remedy for a rootless, meaningless existence. New life from the one who told us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And now for broadcast around the earth, here's program number 2,496 in the series Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. All right. Denny wants to race. He thinks his truck has more power than mine. You're going to race on these roads? It's awfully hilly, Mike. Ah, makes it a real challenge, huh? He's trying to pass when there's a curve up ahead. Don't do it. There's a car coming. Good. Denny dropped back. This is stupid, Mike. Give it up. Too late now. You're going too fast, Mike. Slow down. We're going to crash. Michael, stop. Uh I'm trying. I can't stop. My brakes are locked up. Please don't let me die and go to hell. Our seven-year-old girl had grown up and once again was facing death, a specter she had confronted several times in the intervening years, often the result of her own decision. Each time she knew the risks, each time she turned away from what she knew was right. This is the true story of Rita Snyder and how she finally made the wise decision right now on Unshackled. I'm Rita, born in 1957 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. My illness at age seven was the most traumatic event of my childhood. I developed fever and swelling in my feet, hands, knees, and elbows, then kidney problems. Antibiotics finally won the day, but doctors never knew the cause, and the illness never returned. Except for that, life was uneventful until I was 13 and found my mother's Bible in the attic. What are you doing with that old Bible? I've been reading it, but it sure is hard to understand. I tried a few times when I was younger. I like the Psalms a lot, but the rest of it doesn't make sense. Everybody should read the Bible at least once. We started a Bible study at school. Who? Just some kids who want to know about God. They let you meet in school? Yeah. We get together at lunchtime. But we have to be real careful the teachers don't find out or they'd try to discourage us. Mm, It shouldn't be that way. You ought to be able to study the Bible if you want. I just wish we had somebody to explain it. Without direction or leadership, our Bible study fell apart. I had never been to a church service, so one day I went by myself to a church nearby. But even at 13, I knew I wouldn't find God in the rituals practiced there, so I never went back. Gradually, I lost interest in being able to find God. When I got to high school, I found it hard to make friends unless I did what the others did, like smoking and breaking the rules. What a drag it is going to school. Yeah, let's cut and go to the lake. Takes money, Rita. You have enough? We can panhandle. I've gotten good at conning people out of their spare change. Hey, I have a better idea. 
Let's walk down to that pool hall where we met that guy last week. The weird one with the eerie? Yeah, I think he was on speed. He offered me some pills. You think it was speed? The way he was acting? You bet it was. Okay, let's go. This time, if he offers me some, I think I'll try it. In the back of my mind, I felt that God was watching over me. But my rebellion grew as I tried various drugs like speed, LSD, and of course drinking. I lived to get high, supporting my habits by panhandling. If we needed clothes, we would shoplift. I felt like I owned the world, doing whatever I wanted with no one to stop me. My parents didn't feel that way. Rita? It's me. What is that funny music? Unshackled. It's a radio program. <laughs> Weird. You ought to listen to it sometime. The people are real, and the stories might help you. What makes you think I need help? Rita, we're honestly thinking about sending you to a girl's home. I won't go. That's exactly what I mean. You don't do anything I ask. You stay out late and cut class. You don't tell me where you are or what you're doing. Why are you like this? I'm not going to listen to this. You will listen. I won't. Rita. Every day when I came home from school, Mother was listening to Unshackled, but I ignored her and the program. My friend Cindy and I took terrible chances, jumping out of cars after hitchhiking with questionable men, hanging around drug addicts and prostitutes. I even overdosed a couple of times. One day, we decided to run away from home. Our parents were close friends, so they'd realized that we were together. We told a casual friend about our plan, and she told us about some people who let us stay with them while we decided where to go. After a few days there, we grew suspicious. I feel kind of uneasy here, Rita. Me too. I mean, every time we talk about going home, they get uptight and they uh, try to talk us out of it. Why should they care what we do or where we go? Yeah. I mean, we hardly know them. Why do they keep insisting we go to Chicago? I don't know, but I'm ready to leave. Right. Let's get out of here. It's locked. They've locked us in. That's scary. Try the patio door. Come on, let's run! You don't even care what you did to us. I just don't see how you could do something like that, Rita. Lots of kids run away, Mom. Oh, but why you? I don't know. The excitement. And you're always on my case. Oh, don't you see the danger you were in? Anything could have happened. We got away, Mom. But what if you hadn't? Well... We did start to wonder about them when we found the door locked. Oh, something is not right about this whole thing. We call the police, and they're coming here to talk to you. Oh, great. Just what I need. It turned out we had been staying with people who were involved with kidnapping girls and forcing them into prostitution. God had protected me from a grim fate. But instead of being grateful, I became worse, getting high as much as possible on speed and LSD. Because I didn't understand God, I wanted to do something to push him out of my thoughts. So I got into astrology, tarot cards, and spell casting. It backfired. What's wrong, Rita? Shh! Don't wake up the others. Why are you so scared? Oh, Cindy, do you see it? What? <gasps> it's the devil! He's right here! Calm down, Rita. Just calm down. He's after me. Don't let him get me. It's just the acid. Remember that. It's all in your mind. No, he's real. <gasps> Maybe so. Evil is real. Acid lets you see the dark side, Cindy. It's awful. I don't ever want to do this again. Close your eyes and try to think good thoughts. I'm afraid to close my eyes. He's after me. <laughs> That was the longest night of my life. After that, I got into meditation because it gave me a natural high, one without drugs, so I didn't risk seeing the devil. But meditation led to frightful visions, and my fear increased. I was pulled between good and evil. In 1974, I graduated from high school with no job, no plans for the future. I wanted to run away, 
and the opportunity came that summer when a carnival came to Milwaukee. <laughs> Why, you're a pretty savvy for someone your age, Rita. <laughs> I've done some panhandling. I recognize a con game when I see it. Hey, you want a job? Come work for me. Doing what? Well, you can, you can run this game. You just get the crowd going. You, you talk them into trying their hand at throwing the rings onto the pop bottles. And if they win, give them a prize? Uh -huh. Only you don't let them win very often. You see, you throw these rings to demonstrate how easy it is, but you give the customer these rings. <laughs> and they're, they're slightly smaller, so they won't fit over the bottle. <laughs> how clever. <laughs> you can't even tell the difference unless you get up close. Yeah, every so often, you just let someone win just to keep me interested. Looks like fun to me. Ah, you'll do great. Man, oh man. Look how much money Rita made again. Well, honey, you did more than anybody. It's easy to talk people out of their money, especially men. Yeah, and you've only been at it two weeks, and you're a pro. You ought to join the carnival, Rita. Think so? Yeah, and we're leaving tonight. Come with us and come see the country. I think I will. The thought of money, travel, and acceptance appealed to me, so I rushed home and tossed some things in my backpack. I stopped to say goodbye to Mom and my brother sitting on the porch. They didn't really believe I'd go. Where are you going? I'm leaving with the carnival. You can't be serious. I am. The boss invited me to go with him to the next town. Where? I don't know, someplace in Illinois. Rita, I'm not sure you should do this. Why not? I want to see the world. I'm not sure I'll be able to ride or anything. Oh, Rita, this is crazy. I had a restlessness inside me that I didn't understand, and a lot of questions, too. Why did God keep sparing my life when I did so many wild things, when I deliberately ran away from him? I tried first one thing and then another, ignoring the risks, but nothing held the answer. As I left home that night, I didn't realize I was headed for even greater dangers, but I knew that I was on my own. Rita had a lot to learn, and she will tell us in a moment. How many times have you met someone going through a crisis and wanted to offer encouragement and hope? Well, we can help. We'd like to send you some unshackled booklets that you can give to the next person who needs assurance. And there's no charge for these booklets, each of which retells one of these true testimonies just as it was broadcast on radio. What a wonderful way to share the good news and introduce others to these exciting radio dramas. Each booklet is a true life story. Each clearly reveals the end result of sin. But each story also shows the incredible love of God, his grace and mercy at work in every life. People who see no way out of their own situation often recognize the way, the truth, and the life presented dramatically. Each booklet concludes with scripture verses and a simple prayer of salvation so that anyone who reads can be saved. Now, even if you've received booklets in the past, we encourage you to write for more. The address of Pacific Garden Mission is 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. That's Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. The phone number, 312-492-9410. 312-492-9410. I rode in the semi-truck with my boss to the next place we worked, a small town in Illinois. What a rude awakening. Instead of making hundreds of dollars, as I imagined, I barely made five dollars a day. From there, we went to Allentown, Pennsylvania. Better, but still not good. I didn't make much money, but I did make friends with a girl named Debbie. I didn't even earn enough for a hotel room. Me neither. Guess we have to sleep in the booth. Well, we're not alone. We have all those stuffed animals to keep us company. Beat some of the creeps that hang around the midway. <laughs> it sure isn't all cracked up to be, is it? What? Life in the carnival. Why, you ingrate. I love being on my feet from 7 in the morning till 11 at night and then sleeping on asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> at least you have a sense of humor. Besides, there's no place else for me to go. The 
carnival workers became my family, some of them good friends, some of them dangerous. I had a date with one of the men who I'd admired from a distance. He took me to his trailer and tried to rape me. I was saved when a friend of his walked into the trailer and I ran out. Rita, what's wrong? <gasps> that jerk tried to rape me. You're kidding. No, he's strong too. If his friend hadn't walked into the trailer, I'd be a goner. What's with these guys anyway? I don't know. They seem to think that they can get away with anything. Some of the guys who hang around here are pretty marginal, but I thought maybe he was different. So did I. Looks can be deceiving. You're really lucky that the guy walked in when he did. Yeah, I've been lucky a lot. It wasn't luck. Once again, for some unknown reason, God had protected me, even though my life was anything but right. One night in Indianapolis, I couldn't sleep and walked around the midway where the full moon made giant shadows of the carnival rides. I felt very alone, but that's when I met Michael sitting in one of the rides. Guess you can't sleep either. <gasps> oh, I didn't see you there. Oh, didn't mean to scare you. I'm not scared. You have to be tough to survive in this business. Yeah. Hey, my name's Mike. What's yours? Rita. Hey, it's like a fantasy world, isn't it, Rita? Kind of like being a kid again. Yeah, maybe that's why we stick around. You're in for the money. Learn what you can, then move on. I'd like to go back to Boston someday and settle down. You're not like most of the other guys that work here. Well, why do you say that? You had some bad experiences? Yeah, one night me and my friend were going to sleep in the game tent and a couple of guys tried to join us. Mm. We told them no and one of them got real belligerent, acted like he had a gun. I had to just act tough. Well, you let me know if anyone bothers you, okay? I'll protect you, Rita. Over the weeks, we spent a lot of time together, talking about our families and ourselves. He asked me to marry him, and we made plans for the future. One day, the boss asked him to drive one of the semi-trucks to the next town, so Debbie and I rode with him. He didn't know that Michael had found a trucker's license dropped by an attendant at the fair. At night, we slept along the road. Then came the terrible race between the trucks when the brakes failed, and I cried out to God. girl's all right? I think so. Oh, I can't move my foot. Oh, my back. Oh, my shoulder's bleeding. Well, we gotta get out of here. Well, don't leave me, you guys. My foot is stuck. We'll all get right. you out, Debbie. Now, hang on. Rita, can you help me? Yeah. Come Let on. me see if I can get your foot free. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Come uh, on. Can you walk? Yeah. Look at the truck. Well, we could have died. Oh. Look at this. It was in the bottom of my backpack. What is it? A pamphlet somebody gave me back in Indianapolis. Prayer power. I knew without doubt that God had heard my prayer and spared not only my life, but my friends as well. None of us was hospitalized. His love began to break through my hard heart, but I still didn't know how to reach him. After the accident, Michael ran away before the police arrived because he was driving that truck illegally. I saw that neither of us was ready for marriage. Physically and emotionally drained, I decided to go home, and the next day I spent all my money for the bus ticket back to Milwaukee. Rita! Oh, I wondered if I'd ever see you again. Sometimes I wondered that myself, Mom. How did you get home? Sixteen hours on the bus. I didn't have enough money left to buy food, but I'm here. Are you hungry, honey? I'll get something for you. No, believe it or not, a Marine bought me lunch yesterday. And then in Chicago, the bus station manager bought me breakfast. Someone's watching out for me. Oh, thank God you're home. I hope you're going to stay. I'm going to stay, Mom. I got a job in a department store and soon forgot about my close encounter with God and the way he had protected me. Weekends, I went bar hopping with friends. For a few months, I dated a guy who turned out to be married, leaving me angry and hurt. I cried continually, blaming God, but someone kept leaving gospel tracts on my cash register at work, and one night during the long bus ride home, I read the tract. God loves you and sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why do we perish? Because of our sins. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God says the penalty for sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Acts 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Oh, God. You love me that much. You're throwing away all those books. Why don't you give them to someone? Because they're evil, and I don't want anybody else to be deceived the way I was. Oh? It feels good getting rid of these. The Bible really is true, Mother. It took me a long time to realize it, but now that I know the truth, I don't want these books around. They're filled with lies and a deadly path. When did you have this change of heart? A few months ago. I read a gospel tract that somebody left at work by the cash register. It sure opened my eyes. I learned a lot, too, listening to Christian radio. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. I accepted him as my Savior a few months ago. Me too, Mom. I prayed on the bus, asking him into my heart and life. Although I read the Bible with understanding, my spiritual growth was slow because I wasn't yet going to church, and I was still going to bars on weekends. In August 1976, I met Scott, a guitar player in a rock band. We dated for 11 months, and during that time, his mother became a Christian, leaving Bibles around their house. I thought he was a Christian because he read the Bibles she left around. Hey, my mom left her Bible here with a few bookmarkers. Listen to this, Rita. It's Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Do you, uh, do you believe that's true? Yes. And how about this? John chapter 6, verse 35. And Jesus saith unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I love to read the things that Jesus said. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? That God would let his only son die like that? The cross is truly a symbol of God's love for us. It took me a long time to realize that. I knew when I was seven that he had the power of life and death. And I knew as a teenager that he was protecting me. But I didn't know why until last year. He protected me because he loved me, even though I didn't love him. I, uh, I love you too, Rita. And I want our marriage to be blessed by the Lord. You mean that? I sure do. And I want us to have the best marriage in the world. And we can with the Lord's help. We were married July 30th, 1977. Things went well for a while, until Scott began to stay out late and drink quite a bit. By then, I didn't go to bars or drink, so I would just stay home and read the Bible. I cried out to God to save our marriage, but things got worse. I reached the point where I thought our marriage was over but God was quietly working in Scott's heart. One night, he came home early. We need to talk, honey. Okay, Scott. I know our, our marriage is in trouble, and, and it's mostly my fault. I, I don't want it to be this way. I shouldn't keep trying to change you. It only makes things worse. I need to change. I, I, I can see that now. Uh, you keep asking me why I go to bars and, and drink if I'm a Christian, and, well, it occurred to me tonight that maybe I'm not a Christian. God can help us, Scott. I know. So let's just get down on our knees right now and dedicate ourselves and our marriage to Jesus. I'm, I'm ready to be saved. Scott never touched alcohol again. We found a good Bible-believing church with an excellent pastor and began to grow spiritually. God answered our prayers beyond our expectations, giving us four children who now range from age 13 to 19. In our church, Scott teaches, leads the music, heads the missionary board, and does the work of a deacon. My ministry is being a mom, praying for my children and teaching them to follow the Lord. But God also uses me in other ways. Oh, Rita, I get so discouraged. 
My teenagers are so rebellious. It seems they'll never come to Jesus. Don't give up on them, Mary. If God can save me, he can save anybody. But you've always been a believer. No, not always. When I was a teenager, I shook my fist at God and told him to leave me alone. You did? Yes, but Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32 says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Years ago, when I read my mother's Bible, God began the process of teaching me about himself. It was a long journey. But one of my favorite verses is Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, which reads, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Friend, let God begin a good work in you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 makes this promise. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If you would like new life in Christ, pray with us right now. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and in need of your forgiveness. And I believe Christ died for my sins, that you raised him from the dead to give us new life. Thank you for the gift of salvation in him. I ask you to come into my heart and life, Lord Jesus, and help me to live for you. If you prayed with us, rejoice. You are now a child of God. Tell someone the good news. Read the Bible and find a church that teaches the Bible. And please let us know so we can send you some literature to help you walk with God. Please note, our new address here at Pacific Garden Mission is 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. That's 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our new phone number is 312-492-9410. 312-492-9410. Our new address here at Pacific Garden Mission is 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. That's 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our new phone number is 312-492-9410. 312-492-9410.